I had the honor and privilege of producing a documentary focusing on a Colorado woman's divine calling. It's received eight film festival selections and some wins, and I wanted to share it with you, hoping to inspire your divine calling. It's very hard to compare kids in Rwanda with the kids in America. It's totally different. There is so much what the kids of Rwanda go through, which the kids in America don't go through. The, how, the house is made of mud. We, ha we, make, we put together mud and we make small bricks. So that's what they use on the walls. And then on the floor, it's just that. The kids in Rwanda, it's really hard for them because I don't think here kids in America go to fetch water before they go to school. Do they? No. Kids, what do you guys want for breakfast? Eggs, bacon. Gigi, did you want waffles? Cereal, Sam? You guys, tell me so we're not late. The kids in Rwanda, each kid has only one pair of uniform, and they make sure they keep it clean. This is good. Mm -hmm. And they have to go to school with an empty stomach. I'm, I don't know if the kids here go to school with an empty stomach. It's really hard. I lived this life. I know how it feels. There's so many days I went to school without a meal. <sighs> I love it. Hi. Welcome to America. Thank you. You're very welcome. Would you like a sample? I love apples so much because it's so hard to get them at home. You don't need to go in the garden to dig and wait for the harvesting time. I'm glad you're here. How long have you been here? Um, 12 days. 12 days? This is culture shock, isn't it? It is. It's amazing. I bet. Here in America, kids don't go to school without food. And they don't have one meal a day. Come on, you guys. We're going to be late. In Rwanda, kids walk a long distance from home to school. You always get shot, God. You give me... I still can't believe that you let him get front. He always gets front. I know some kids who walk a whole one hour to school and then another hour back home. By the time they get home, it's already dark and they have to go to fetch water. They have to wash the dishes. They have to do homework on a candle, which someone is, uh, is counting minutes for them to use because this candle is budgeted for a whole week. What these children do not have in material things, they more than make up for in spirit. And that enduring spirit inspires William and Cavini to make this long trip to and from school, as they have done for the last seven years. Their school is an oasis of hope, not far from the capital city of Kigali. Aptly named Hope Haven, Rwanda. Why the name Hope Haven, Rwanda? Well, I feel like it's a haven of hope. The kids are protected. It's a haven. So it's a haven of hope. Their families are protected. It's a haven of hope. So it's called Hope Haven, Rwanda. Before Hope Haven, Susan spent all of her time with her husband and children on their Colorado cattle ranch. She's a cowgirl. And she appeared to have it all. 
but she'll tell you something was missing. My husband and I, we took our kids on a mission trip. And you know, it seems expensive. It seems like, you know, are you really accomplishing anything? But what it accomplished in me was it started building up this love for other people that I didn't even know. To me, she's a savior. I've been a Christian my whole life, but then I really wanted a deeper relationship. She transformed me. God purposes everyone in this world. We all have different purposes. And so you can only release those purposes into this world by giving people an opportunity. I always wanted a place where I can be a voice. And I did what I thought I could do to help. But frankly, it was really frustrating. But God started replacing my frustration with dreams of what could be. How to lift up the family, how to educate kids, how to do it well, how to do it with excellence. Just as she has done with every aspect of her life, especially her vision for Hope Haven. And here she comes with her dream of helping this community I mean, when she employed me, it never felt like a job. This is the sentiment of each and every person involved at Hope Haven, who will tell you this is much more of a divine calling. God opened a way for me to speak for these kids. Here in Rwanda, on the outskirts of the capital city of Kigali. There wasn't a single school in probably a 15 mile radius. But that didn't stop founder Susan Holleran, who remembers early classes under this giant acacia tree. But what you have to imagine is not only did we have this tree, but all of this was bush. We had six foot tall grass. William and Kavini were there from the beginning. You were under the tree? Yes. Seven years ago? Yes. When we were under the tree, we were not very happy because it was not looking nice. And now, the buildings are very big and there's no rain falling on us. But it took two years to build any buildings here. Excitement is an understatement as local workers and parents of students join together for a common vision, a school, a community, a family. The last five years, we've erected 38,000 square feet. Every worker is from our immediate community. So they have learned brickling skills. They've learned cement skills. And they've learned roofing skills. All the skills that it takes to actually get a job somewhere else. That tree still stands at Hope Haven's entrance. A tribute to overcoming incredible odds, entering a society not accustomed to outsiders being there, let alone caring. What we found is that children would miss school. Nathan Kempton is the original director of Hope Haven. And we had no way of knowing what was happening to these children. If I see a child has missed two days, I go home and I talk to the parents. We would ask questions. We'd say, you know, where is, where's Rachel? I see why the child is not coming to school. We sit and talk about it. We find a solution. Since we've been in existence, we've had three children die that were our students, because nobody told us. And you're just like, why did somebody tell us this child was sick? And they would just say, well, we didn't think anybody cared. I want to know where this child is. Does this child need a, a lift to the hospital? Do we just need to get medication? What do we do to save this child? And we are happy that there is a big change, that we see children who came, who had jiggers, who couldn't walk with shoes, who could feel isolated. Today they love school and they enjoy being in the environment. It's our duty as Christians in this world, in Morindi, to take care of these people. We're all God's children. We're a family. 
We thought maybe 20 kids, maybe 10, will want to come under this tree because we didn't have anything to make us look like a school. We had parents lined up at the gate. Kids were under the tree. Then it was apparent that we needed a tent because it would start raining. By May, we had 97 children. And we've grown ever since. <laughs> And it's the opportunity for these kids to have a future. If we don't teach, these kids will just be back in the fields like their mom and dad. These children run to school every day. They love being here. They love the camaraderie. Also, we feed them. That was a lesson we learned early on in 2012. The kids were so hungry, they couldn't focus, their heads were laying on the table, they were holding their stomachs. Their attention span wasn't there. They were, there was illness that would run rampant through the kids. So within a week or two, we actually started a porridge program. The next step was is teaching them about hygiene. The kids were sick, and so then we started looking at their hands and their hands were filthy. So we started hand washing. The kids would arrive, we'd line them up, they'd all wash their hands before they even went into school. The tree also symbolizes the future. Oh boy, now I'm really dreaming. <laughs> We're on our way to high school. I thought I would be done at sixth grade. That was gonna be a big accomplishment. Now we're gonna go to 12th grade. And of course, it serves as a constant reminder that even small seeds when nurtured, can grow into greatness. I want to become a doctor. I want to be the, the manager of the World Bank. I wish to be a teacher when I grow up. And if national test scores are any indication, they'll be whatever they want to be. Because every student here taking that test scored in the top 3%, making Hope Haven the top performing school in all of Rwanda. <laughs> yes, it's true. Okay. <laughs> can you believe it? I can. You guys are the smartest cookies in the whole country. <laughs> cookies? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think we are cookies. <laughs> <laughs> but smart cookies they are. Uh, thank you, Susan, for building this beautiful Hope Heaven. Thank you for treating us very well. And thank you for loving us, and we love you so much. I wanted to thank her for taking good care of us in this village and this town. I'm thanking her because she did a great job. And the winning recipe is exactly what you'd expect in any top performing school. Large, beautiful classrooms. A library. Dedicated teachers. We actually have teacher interviews here. There's a third party that comes in and helps conduct an interview. Watching what's going on in the classroom. We can have 20, 30, 25 or 30 people that we're, we've gotten down to the final interview, and we haven't hired one. We start all over. If we don't have the great teachers that we want, willing to do the Hope Haven way, then we just simply start over. And then the other thing that we do to really reinforce learning, because teachers coming in, even though they're good teachers, they still don't know exactly what we're doing in the classrooms and how we're integrating other kinds of learning. So we always pair a teacher that has been at Hope Haven, that has been trained by these different people who is learning and progressing, they are paired with another qualified teacher, not an intern, but a second qualified teacher. So we actually have two qualified teachers in a classroom of not more than 45 children. And the very latest technology. Plus things you don't often see, like health care and delicious homegrown meals. These kids are eating rice and beans, but with the tomatoes from our garden, the dodo from our garden, the eggplant from our garden, zucchini from our garden, carrots from our garden, all these you know, we're providing so much nutrition, and it's fresh. So the parents have actually hoed the gardens, planted the gardens, watered the gardens, picked the food, and now they're serving it to their children, in effect. I mean, how 
inspiring for them that they can actually provide for their children. And so I think it's really important, sure, Hope Haven provides these meals, but they feel like they're a very big part of what their children are getting. I have two girls in this school. I come here and do gigging and do something and get school fees for my children. And that's called dignity. To fully appreciate the significance of the school, you must understand the violent history of Rwanda. Just 25 years ago, the families of these children were aligned on either side of a mortal combat, a state-sponsored genocide where the ruling Hutus slaughtered nearly one million people of the Tutsi minority over a 100-day period. And my father told me, Everyone is dead. I don't have a family. You'll never see your grandmother. You'll never see your uncle. You'll never see your auntie. I lost everyone. So when we go back, you will also die. So my parents were refugees, and I was born as a refugee. I, I was raised in a refugee camp, and it was so hard to live in Uganda. And this is the hardest part about living in Uganda as a refugee, because when people were killing each other in Rwanda, the Hutus killing Tutsis, there is a river, it's called River Nyabarongo. It could carry dead bodies to Uganda. And when it carried dead bodies to Uganda, people stopped fishing. Fishing was banned in Uganda because the fish had injected, ingested uh, body parts of, of people. Miraculously, Rwandans now live together in peace and harmony, in one of the most successful social reconciliations of all time. This supernatural story of forgiveness is what inspired Susan. It was really put on my heart to be a haven of hope for the community and the families, not just the kids. I raise a banner to the Lord and glorify God. He blessed us with someone to love and care for us. She didn't know us, but gave us everything to make our lives better. Because what happens, Stephanie, parents have died. So you have several generations of people that were raised as child parents. They raised younger siblings, not to mention just the abject poverty. It's really amazing and we are so happy that God has changed everything here and also changing the community. Where do you get all the money to do this, Susan? It's remarkable. That is private donations. I mean, I have to say I get nervous about it. But you know, the anxiety stops because we have a God of abundance. And many generous donors answering the call. The impact that we have here is bigger than any impact that we have in any other organization we work with. Brian and Christine Best have been supporting and visiting Hope Haven from the beginning. And despite all of the good they've done, they know there is so much more to do. She doesn't have a home. Her father is a drunkard who comes home once in a week or twice. That means this little girl always go home by herself and just finds herself in the house just alone. She had a little sister and the baby passed away because they didn't have anything to eat. They didn't have where to sleep. Everything was so hard for her. How do you process it? That's why we're here. Hope Haven is um, their hope. And it really truly is a haven because we, we just saw where she lives, and um, no child should live that way. One way Susan hopes to grow her school is by asking people to invest in one child or more throughout their entire time here at Hope Haven, Rwanda, to ensure their development and their destinies. For a cup of coffee a day, $4 a day, we're educating the kids, serving them two meals. The parents are working during this earning and learning programs. We're paying for jobs. All of these things encompass the $4 a day. My heart is with that little girl. I plan to invest in her until she graduates. I want to come back and celebrate with her. I want to be a part of her life. And for Adelphine, this program this $4 a day 
means survival. Every day her life is changing and she has a smile on her face. <laughs> yeah, I am so grateful that uh, a lot of kids are living this life in our community, but every day Hope Heaven is bringing a change and transforming so many families in this community. I am so happy to see her growing because she's now living a promising future. Hope Heaven is saving her life and is still saving more kids in this community. And despite a temporary shutdown during a global pandemic, the Earning and Learning program not only survived, but is thriving with a brand new high school built on the adjacent land. In the back row here, you'll see a whole construction site. So this is going to include a 36 classroom secondary school and a boarding facility for 960 students. That was then. This is now. The secondary school is complete. Grades 7 through 12, 185,000 square feet, eventually housing and educating nearly 1,000 students. That's in addition to the original nursery and primary schools with another 1,000 children. A full 17 acres of opportunity and hope. And William is still here. Now a freshman in high school planning to be a doctor. I want to grow up and do medicine so that I can be able to, do, to treat those diseases that uh, people are suffering from. To say this tree, the shelter for that very first class branched out, is an understatement. <laughs> so next time you're watching your kids do homework, remember William and all of the students at Hope Haven also doing their homework under slightly different conditions, but dreaming just as big. I don't know if my dreams will come true, but I want to be a president. A what? A president. A president of Rwanda? Yes. Why wouldn't you be? You've got all the right stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Who are we missing in this world? Who are we missing to poverty? Who are we missing to a lack of opportunity? We're all the same in Jesus' size. You know, just because somebody is poor doesn't mean they're dumb. I guarantee the kids are so much smarter than I am. And since I completed this documentary, even more blessings. The students at Hope Haven continue to impress. Recently, their first ever debate team competed on a world stage, starting in Nairobi, Kenya, for the World Scholars Cup. Where they were invited to face off against 2,400 students from 17 countries. They walked away with 18 gold medals and top honors for their school. I'm so happy to have been able to participate in World Scholars Cup Nairobi Regional Round. Being in Kenya and participating in this competition was a great experience for me. I had to learn a lot. I met new friends. I had to interact with other students coming from all over the world, and it was a great experience to me. When I went for the Scholars Cup, each person is nervous for the first time, but I experienced a lot. I learned a lot. I learned the speaking skills, the writing skills, everything, even to work on time. I learned to, to share things, to share ideas. I got time to, to show my talents. Uh, during the debate, the team debates, I've learned being confident, being confident in yourself, and also learning different perspectives of people, based on how we people, their ideas, and we get to share ideas. 
We are here at the team representing Rana, the land of a thousand years. And I'm here to debate in the motion of today that saying that I had to learn how to work first. I, I was able to know that working as a team is a very important thing for each and everyone in order to succeed. The debate we had to, to go through the six rounds. Each team had to go through three rounds since we are two teams. And successfully we managed to pass through and we managed to, to win all the six rounds. The networking that they get to have and the exposure to be able to accommodate one another in this large society and accepting each other because they come from diverse backgrounds is incredible. And one of the events that we participated in was the collaborative writing, whereby we sit down and after we sit and we write um, about different topics in a team. And after f uh, we have 15 minutes for sharing ideas and to fight for writing. It's uh, where learners participate as a team of three and like you share ideas on different topics and you choose the ideas on what you're, on what you're going to be talking about. Um, and then you share your ideas, what you think about that topic. And that's where we learners, we get to develop like more skills on how we can be creative, be innovative. And after you're done, you go in the schoolers' ball where they ask you a series of multiple questions and then you click to the right answer when you have the clicker in a theater. And then when you click to the right answer, that's when you're already done. We performed like different tastes on science, art, music, and all this is being able to to help us, we as learners, to be able to raise our critical thinking. I got uh, a lot of information that I didn't have. It was a great journey that opened up our minds and my mind, um, which was really great. Uh, with, uh, we, we, our team won the second trophy of the best debate team, and we really we were really proud of, of being out here. And we were also able to win the 23 medals in total, the 18 gold medals and the fives. Yeah. Allow me to take this wonderful opportunity to thank so much the staff, administration, and most importantly to thank our founder, Madam Susan Horan, for supporting us. We wouldn't make it without her support. So I take this opportunity to thank her so much for supporting us. After Nairobi, they went on to Qatar and then came here to the United States to compete at Yale University. And while the students were shining brightly all over the world, construction continued on the brand new sports complex at Hope Haven, complete with the new soccer field and stadium seating, basketball, volleyball, and pickleball courts with locker rooms. The visitors area of the campus is also expanding to host even more people. And I highly recommend putting a visit to Hope Haven, Rwanda on your bucket list. If only everyone could experience what it's like when someone decides to step into the darkness and turn on the light of Christ. The families and students I met in Rwanda shared with me how they thank God for sending Susan Holleran from Denver, Colorado to give them a hope and a future through more love than they ever thought possible.